Welcome. Hi, I'm Dr. Priscilla Slenis um, from Boston University Medical Center, and I'm going to be giving you a very short primer on breast anatomy. Our goals today are to review the basic breast anatomy and to discuss how anatomy will influence the care of women who present to your office or practice with breast disease. So let's start with some basic embryology. So when you're in utero, uh, the breast will develop from an ectodermal infolding called the mammary ridge, or more informally, the milk line, which extends from the axilla all the way down to the groin. As the fetus is developing in utero, over time, this uh, mammary ridge will regress so that eventually all that you're left with is uh, the mammary tissue, which should be in this location where we normally will have the breasts anatomically positioned. However, it's important to be aware of this uh, embryologic development because, in fact, patients could have breast tissue or supernumerary nipples or uh, anywhere along this milk line itself. In fact, less than or about 5% of women actually have a residual breast tissue up in the axilla, which we refer to as accessory breast tissue. And this becomes important clinically because some of those patients will present with symptoms related to that tissue itself. So the breast does not fully develop until uh, actually puberty. And up until that point, it's really just a branching ductal system. But at puberty, that is when the secretory asini will then sprout and form the terminal ducts uh, in order to form those lobules. And here you can see the breast tissue here on the mammogram of this patient. And notice up here in the left side, there is accessory breast tissue. As I mentioned, this is important because sometimes this accessory breast tissue does not communicate with the rest of the breast tissue. So during lactation, this can be particularly challenging because it will fill up with milk and not be able to empty or patients with accessory breast tissue sometimes become very symptomatic in the latter part of their menstrual cycle, and they'll present you with a palpable tender area um, as a result of the inflammation that can happen in that tissue. So the breast tissue uh, basically lies between the uh, subcutaneous uh, fat, uh, which is located between the skin and the pectoralis fascia, so you'll have skin, subcutaneous fat, you'll have some breast tissue and a branching ductal system, which we'll go into detail in just a minute. Um, and then all of that tissue is supported by the Cooper's ligaments, which is basically connective tissue that extends from the dermis back to the pectoralis fascia. So the breast, as you can see, is lying on top of the pectoralis muscle, and beneath the muscle you'll have your ribs and chest wall. There are 15 to 25 lobules and lactiferous ducts uh, that produce milk during lactation um, that all uh, centrally uh, start or come together at the nipple or relar complex. And then there's breast stroma, which is the connective tissue that is within and between those breast lobules. We can see the ductal system on imaging on MRI if there happens to be protonaceous or hemorrhagic debris in the ducts or we can do a galactogram or ductogram where we inject radiopaque contrast into the ductal system and then can image it on mammography. The other clinically relevant anatomy that we need to think about is the blood supply to the breast, the innervation, and then the lymphatic drainage. So the arterial supply, 60% of it comes from the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery, which is a branch of the subclavian artery. It runs along the sternal border and has multiple medial perforating arteries. And this is important to be aware of because if you're doing a biopsy and you're coming from a medial approach, there's a chance that you could uh, pass through one of these perforating arteries and consequently uh, cause a significant hematoma. Another third of the uh, arterial blood supply to the breast comes from the lateral thoracic artery, which is a branch off of the axillary artery. And then there's a very small amount of uh, arterial blood supply coming from the thoracoacromial arteries and the posterior intercostal arteries. Most of the time, we will not see the arteries on imaging, but if they do calcify, such as on this mammogram, you can actually see the arterial system quite well. Now, what about the venous drainage? So primarily, most of the drainage is through the axillary vein but some of it will go through to the internal mammary vein, both of which will go in eventually into the superior vena cava. And then there is a little bit of drainage to the posterior intercostal veins, 
into the azygous and hemiazygous system. Why do we care about the venous drainage? Well, that is how one way that breast tumors can spread from the breast hematogenously to other parts of the body, predominantly the bones, the liver, the lung, and the brain, such as here in this patient who has a liver metastasis. Now, innervation is important to know about, but it's most important for our surgical colleagues to know about because it, when they're doing surgery, if they damage some of the uh, nerves, patients can have certain uh, symptoms that persist. For example, if they were to cut across the intercostal brachial nerve, they'll get loss of sensation to the posterior medial aspect of the upper arm uh, versus the long thoracic nerve, which innervates the serratus anterior, leading to a wing scapula or the thoracodorsal nerve, which will lead to weakness of the latissimus dorsi muscle. The most important thing for us to know is that the fourth to sixth intercostal nerves provide anterior and lateral cutaneous branches that then pass through the pectoralis fascia and go to the breast surface to provide sensory fibers as well as the sympathetic fibers that uh, go to the blood vessels and the smooth muscles in the nipple areolar region. And this is important uh, during uh, lactation. And finally, the lymphatic drainage that happens in the breast is important because this is also another path of potential metastasis. So it was discovered that basically all the lymphatics go to a subareolar lymphatic plexus before about 95% of it drains towards the axilla, so it goes into the axillary lymph nodes. Um, and some of it then will also potentially, the other percentage will go into the parasternal nodes and even into the contralateral breast. The axillary lymph nodes will drain into the subclavian lymphatic trunk, and the parasternal lymph nodes drain into the main lymphatic ducts. So in summary, the breast is really a modified sweat gland. It's composed of fat, glandular lobules, ligaments of Cooper, and the ducts, with about 5 to 20 ducts converging on the nipple areolar complex. And keep in mind that it's the amount of fat that really is thought to be related to the breast size. Uh, not as much the amount of glandular tissue itself. So if you have a patient who has a problem, you know, you're going to perform a clinical evaluation. You're going to want to uh, assess their symptoms, their risk factors, and you're obviously going to be performing a physical exam. And then you're going to think broadly about both benign and malignant possibilities. Keep in mind that the, the breast disease predominantly happens in the terminal duct lobular unit. So invasive uh, cancers typically happen in the terminal duct if it's a ductal cancer or in the lobule itself if it's a lobular cancer. We can image using mammography so we can get a craniocaudal view, which is the top down or a medial lateral oblique view. And you can see some anatomy, particularly on the medial lateral oblique view, you can see here the pectoralis muscle, some axillary lymph nodes. So this is the upper breast and the lower breast. And in the craniocaudal view, you have the lateral breast and the medial breast. You can see the breast parenchyma, which in these two patients is very different. This patient is much more heterogeneously dense, and this patient is much fattier. Um, and you can obviously see the skin surface and the nipple that you can see in profile. On ultrasound, you can also see a normal breast anatomy. Just keep in mind that ultrasound is typically used to evaluate a palpable lump or a finding on mammography. Um, it is in some states also now used for screening of women who have dense breast tissue, but that's not uniform across the United States. So you can see this echogenic line here is the skin surface. Underneath the skin is the subcutaneous fat. Then you have more echogenic heterogeneous uh, glandular breast tissue. You will then more posteriorly see the striations of the pectoralis muscle, and beneath the muscle you will see the ribs. MR imaging the breast also allows you to see a lot of a breast anatomy. Uh, MR, just so you know, is predominantly used to look at silicone implant integrity, to evaluate cancer extent, and also to screen high-risk women. This is a woman who here has a spiculated cancer. But you can see the skin surface of the breast. You can see the fat, the glandular tissue, the pectoralis muscle, the ribs. And you can also see the internal mammary region. Here's the artery in the vein but this is where you would look for internal mammary uh, lymph nodes, and you can often see the sternum and the rest of the chest wall and up into the axilla. So let's apply some of our basic anatomy principles to caring for this lovely 60-year-old woman who presented with a palpable breast slump. 
You can see this little triangle was placed over the area that she was bothered by. And what you can sort of see here, you can sense that there's a nodular asymmetry here. And you can sense that there's something going on in that area. On the magnified images, now you get a much better sense of an irregular mass um, and uh, no suspicious calcifications, although there are a few scattered calcifications, and there are no overlying skin changes or skin retraction. She went on to have an ultrasound, and now you can see there's a hypoechoic irregular mass. There does appear to be a lot of posterior acoustic enhancement, but within the mass, there's also some echogenic foci suggesting calcifications, and there's internal vascularity. We imaged in the axilla and found it concentrically thickened lymph node with a cortical thickness of 5 millimeters. So she had biopsies of both the mass and the lymph node. The mass turned out to be a grade 2 invasive ductal cancer, and the lymph node actually turned out to be reactive. She had a preoperative breast MRI to look for disease extent, um, and her contralateral breast just uh, showed no nothing of significance. But in the uh, left side, where she has the known malignancy, which has very worrisome kinetics here, there were multiple other sites of cancer, and therefore, surgically, it was decided that she would be treated with a mastectomy. Prior to the surgery, now the, they had to decide how to stage her uh, axilla um, to see if the tumor had spread outside of the breast. And this is where anatomy again comes into play because the surgeons want to sample what are called level one nodes, and those are the lymph nodes that would be found lateral to the pectoralis minor muscle. And occasionally they'll try to get level two nodes, which are deep to the pectoralis minor muscle. Um, and those are the nodes that they would like to target. Level three nodes, which are medial to the pectoralis minor muscle, are typically not surgically excised. Um, and the options to a stage of the axilla include a complete axillary node dissection, which carries a significant risk of chronic uh, arm lymphedema, um, a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which takes advantage of the lymphatic drainage pattern that we now know exists in the breast, and axillary radiation. So this patient underwent a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And so what does that entail? And the reason we can do it is, again, remember that the lymph lymphatics drain to the subarealar plexus, which greater than 95% of that drainage goes to the axilla. The reason the sentinel lymph node biopsy will work is that if it node is negative, then that patient has a less than 5% chance of metastatic spread. If it's positive, the overall prognosis becomes less favorable and they typically will be receiving systemic chemotherapy. So the nuclear medicine radiologist or the breast radiologist will inject a radioactive isotope into the breast itself. Sometimes they'll also inject a, a blue dye or methylene blue into the breast. Both of those tracers will be picked up by the lymphatic system and then go to the first draining node or nodes in the axilla. And those are the nodes that the surgeon then will identify with a gamma counter in the operating room, and they will remove those and send them for histopathology. So our patient underwent the mastectomy and the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Her tumor was 2.2 centimeters. It was triple negative. All of her axillary nodes were negative, and her staging PET-CT was uh, unremarkable except for the primary uh, breast cancer. So does she need to have additional treatment? Um, this patient, because of her size of her tumor and the fact it was triple negative, did receive systemic chemotherapy, and she also did receive chest wall radiation. So in conclusion, now I hope you have a much better understanding of how breast anatomy plays into how we care for patients and that how we can use imaging to both detect, diagnosis, and guide the treatment of women with breast disease. Thank you very much.